Welcome to the LSE for this online event. My name is Steve Pischke, and I'm a professor in the economics department at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm very pleased to welcome Diane Coyle to the LSE today. Diane is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy at Cambridge University, where she co-directs the Bennett Institute, uh, heading research under the themes of progress and productivity. Diane is an unusual academic. She gets out more of purely academic circles, and she also constantly watches our discipline and how it develops as an insider. So today, Diane will discuss how much economics is to blame for crises like the financial crash, inequality, or even climate change. How does the discipline need to change in light of challenges ranging from digital disruption to reaching net zero? Uh, economist Diane Coyle reflects on our profession and highlights its strengths and its weaknesses. So for those of you on Twitter, in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is LSE Econ. This is an online event and it's being recorded and will hopefully be available as a podcast that of course is always subject to us having no technical difficulties. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Diane at the end. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted to myself and I will pose as many as possible. Please let us know your name and affiliation. We're particularly keen to hear from our students and alumni, so please let us know. Diane's new book related to this event is entitled Cogs and Monsters. Now I'm delighted to hand over to her. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to the Economics Department at the LSE for um, giving me this opportunity to talk about the new book um, and I will just um, go on to the screen share so uh, hopefully somebody will tell me if you can see that now Steve can you see the slides yes we can we can see your screen uh, I'm going to stop sharing and try again because I think it's, it's, it's not doing slideshow. It wasn't full screen, no. So let me just try that again. Sorry, we all ought to be uh, used to Zoom by now, but um, let's close that. We still have these technical difficulties. You get to see what I got on my screen. So uh, let me close some of these. Mm -hmm. We Not seeing it right now. I tried this a moment ago and it worked perfectly. Trust me, people. Have another go. Sharing, slideshow, play from start, hooray. Yes. So um, thank you for bearing with me through that. So yes, thank you to the um, LSE for hosting, um, hosting me this evening and to all of you for tuning in. So I'm going to talk about what I think is um, problematic or wrong with economics, if you like, but I want to start by talking about what I think is so right about it. I am an economist and I don't identify myself as heterodox or mainstream or any of those schools, um, but I have been doing economics now for 40 years or so and value incredibly the insights it gives us into the world. And uh, we're very influential. Here's a figure showing you the number of economists in the UK Government Economic Service. It was founded in 1964 by Alec Cancross. And there had been economics in government before. Clearly, Keynes and the war is a famous example, but it wasn't a profession. So 1964 saw the foundation of the profession of economic policy analysis, analysis in government. And as you can see from the chart, it's grown quite substantially particularly through the 2000s, uh, a lot of growth before the financial crisis and uh, a lot of growth recently. I have not got the more recent years on here, but the numbers have gone up even more with uh, the demands of Brexit on, on economic analysis. And so we have as a profession a particularly privileged role at the heart of government. 
and uh, are very influential. And that makes what we say and what we do and how we do it really important for policy outcomes for people in the UK and elsewhere. And there's a lot of good to uh, welcome. This chart shows um, an assessment of the work produced by the National Bureau of Economic Research, one of the best known series of working papers. It's um, largely American economists, but others also. And the types of paper are color coded. And so what you see here is really an illustration of what's called the applied term economics, the development of um, the techniques of um, microeconomic analysis and econometrics, the availability of databases, the availability of computational power. And so the mixture of work done in economics has changed and changed, um, in my view, for the better. I get into trouble with macroeconomists for saying, I think we really don't know very much and actually quite a lot of it is unknowable. And uh, there's part of that in, in the book, but you can see actually as a proportion of what economists are publishing in this frontier series of working papers that has shrunk anyway. Finance has grown and it grew quite a lot before the financial crisis clearly, but it's this applied micro and all of the areas of social policy into which economics gives us incredibly powerful insights. Now, anybody who's a student or a recent student will know that there are some fantastic textbooks about this um, e e approach to economics. And so here's one and here's another. And here is me awarding the Enlightened Economist uh, Prize to the authors of these textbooks because it was my favorite book that I read that year. And I wanted to start with this to underline the point that there's a lot that's good about economics and we have a lot of powerful insight to contribute across government in this really influential role we have in policy advice. But all is not well. And one of the things that frustrates me is that there are many critics of economics who I think miss some of the really important points about why as a subject we need to change. And here's one of them, and this has been in the news a lot, so many people listening will be very familiar with um, the general point here. This is a, a visualization of the data from the Rural Economic Society's Committee on the Women in Economics. And um, the figures are really not very good. So among academic economists, just over a quarter are women. If you go to full professors, 15% are women. Um, the proportions of uh, women of color, even lower, and no female black professors of economics in the UK over a six year period. Um, the figures are a little bit better, but not much if you look at, look at students rather than um, practicing academics. If you look outside of the academy, the Government Economic Service has actually done a really good job at diversifying its uh, employment base, more women, more people of colour, uh, more people from uh, non-middle-class um, backgrounds or non-traditional backgrounds through their apprenticeship programme, which seems to be bearing real fruit. But I think also in the city or in the major employers now of economists in the tech sector, this, this problem of the of a narrow pipeline of people who are not white male and middle class is really quite widespread. And this really matters because none of us can know about things that are outside our experience. And the kind of narrow social base for the economics discipline means that quite a narrow range of questions get addressed. You don't know what you don't know. So as a social science, we don't know the whole range of questions that, that we should be asking or um, understand entirely what it is that the databases we download are capturing in terms of people's social experience. So there's an argument there for working in more interdisciplinary ways, which I think is really important for academics in general and economists in particular, but also um, uh, fundamentally diversifying the population base of the, of the subject. Economics is most like computer science and engineering and philosophy and mathematics and not very much like other social sciences. You're not going to do good social science if you're so unrepresentative of the societies that you're studying. So I wanted to start with that point and I'm going to come back to that a bit later on. But I want to move on to um, another point that I think is um, much overlooked. And it dates back to this very famous 
LSE economist Lionel Robbins, who wrote this book, an essay on the nature and significance of economic science. Um, I think it was 1936, in the 1930s, at a time when logical positivism was a very powerful, influential philosophy. Logical positivism said that the only meaningful statements are uh, about which you can say they are true or false are those based on factual evidence, empirical evidence. And this was translated uh, not only through Robbins, but through Keynes and other well-known economists at the time into this received wisdom that economics is neutral as between ends. Economics can't pronounce on the validity of ultimate judgments of value. And so this is claiming a separation between um, the how and the ought, the, the what and the ought. Uh, we do positive economics, we talk about data, uh, we can pronounce on factual questions, but when it comes to value judgments, we're going to leave that to the politicians in a democracy, we're going to leave it to people, or philosophers, to people who think about value judgments. We are not going to be concern ourselves with the ends, only with the means. And this has become really deeply embedded in economics. And so, so some other examples. Um, Milton Friedman famously made this distinction between positive and normative economics, uh, citing Keynes here. And um, Esther Duflo, much more recently, economics uh, she compared to plumbing. And so these are the analogies that people use. Economics is like engineering. It's like dentistry, which was Keynes's uh, analogy. It's like plumbing. So we are the technicians. We see a problem, we gather some evidence, uh, we've got great data now, we've got great new techniques for addressing these questions, and we're going to be objective about the answers. And there's something really admirable about that. If you're a profession that's in that position of influence over government policy, then we ought to be trying to be as objective as possible, to be as evidence-based as possible. And uh, the UK in particular has really been at the forefront of emphasizing evidence-based policy. So I don't want to denigrate the attempt to be objective. And indeed that dates right back to Adam Smith and his concept of the impartial spectator. But I think we overclaim for the possibility of separating the, um, the, the positive and the normative. And our language misleads us a bit because we talk about economic efficiency what's the economically efficient outcome? And actually that is a concept that's based on a, a really strong normative framework. We are utilitarian. We have the concept of utility and the maximization of utility. And that is a, a philosophical doctrine that is, um, embeds uh, pow powerful value judgments. And other philosophers would disagree quite strongly with that philosophical basis for the claim of efficiency. And then we have the idea of Pareto optimality or Pareto efficiency. So we rule out for ourselves thinking about distributional questions. This idea that as long as something makes one person better off and nobody else worse off, then that's an improvement in society. But we rule out the possibility of interpersonal comparisons of utility. So this word efficiency actually encapsulates some very strong normative um, views or, or um, uh, dimensions. And yet, because we use the word efficiency, that gets even among economists translated into these much more technical concepts of efficiency, what an engineer would mean by efficiency, but they're very different kinds of concepts. And so um, here's an example. This is a, from the Treasury um, recent update on its Green Book guidance, and it incorporates this work by some LSE economists uh, uh, using the concept of well-bees. And this is fantastic, uh, fundamentally, because the idea that what we care about in terms of progress or economic outcomes isn't narrowly about market outcomes, um, but a much wider range of measures of, of well-being is surely a good thing for economists to be talking about and the direction for economic policy. But when you look at the um, formulae that are uh, captured in this guidance and you find out that you can calculate a well be as 16,000 pounds, that seems a bit reductive. And surely there are value judgments embedded in that. So we've come up with a number that can be fed into cost benefit analysis that the Green Book framework gives us. Um, and that number disguises a lot of value judgments. And in fact, the inherent multidimensionality of concepts of welfare 
or the fact that if we're thinking about the welfare of society, we do truly want to think about interpersonal comparisons and the distribution of both income and well-being between people. And so that's just one example. Another example, which is much closer to my um, own area of work, is thinking about competition policy. And for many years now, in many jurisdictions, we have had a sort of universalist approach to consumer welfare as the basis for making competition policy decisions. So every jurisdiction has a legal framework set by its na national legislators, but the economic analysis that goes into that is expert. And we try to calculate the impact on consumer surplus of whether a merger will go ahead or not. And there are lots of issues that um, have not been considered to be important in that. So one example is that ownership doesn't matter. If a foreign company wants to take over a UK company, then in the competi direct competition analysis, the ownership doesn't matter. Similarly, um, a lot of competition analysis doesn't treat um, the inherent dynamics of markets in a very easy way. The analysis is often static or, or comparative statics. When you think about digital markets, where I did some work through the Furman Review Panel a couple of years ago, any decision you take about mergers or uh, behavior in digital markets is going to have lasting outcomes over the whole future path of the economy because these are winner take all markets and they tip in one direction or another. You generally get one company or two companies that are dominant in digital markets. And there are examples of um, uh, analyses that were done in the conventional framework that didn't take account of the effect on future investment or future market structures or indeed the ownership of these digital giants. So the competition, the consumer welfare framework, the universal the technocratic framework actually rules out a lot of the things that we might want to think are important in economic policy, which do involve value judgments. And that's about global markets and the ownership of these giant companies uh, that dominate their particular markets. We're starting to think more now about workers and you can put that in the universal framework and think about monopsony power, power on the buyer side of the market rather than the seller side of the market. But we might also want to care about the location of production or the location of research and development. Um, we might want to think about geopolitical issues which have come to the fore in um, decisions about telecommunications markets, for example. And so the kind of economy we have now, the way it's shaping, being uh, shaped by technologies, by geopolit geopolitics, um, means that decisions taken in uh, consumer, consumer um, in competition authorities will tip the market one way or the other. Whether you let a merger go ahead or whether you prevent it, it's going to shape the future market. And that can't simply be a technocratic decision. The politics have to come in there. And um, this is an area where I think the way the economy itself is changing is changing the kind of economic analysis that's needed. And indeed, competition authorities around the world, including the UK, are responding to that. Um, there are signs that a lot of economists are um, starting to think in a, a much broader way than has been typical in the past. And so I've put an example here of a really great column recently by Darona Samoglu at MIT, talking about economics needing to step up to the plate on climate change. Uh, very timely this week, of course. And so he made these points that are very familiar to many people who've been working in environmental economics for years now, uh, that there are nonlinear dynamics here, that the interaction of economic systems and physical systems means that there are very real tipping points below which biodiversity will completely collapse or above which climate systems will change completely. And so a small increment will lead to very, very big changes in the system. Um, this point that was familiar from Nick Stern's review some years ago, that the social discount rate that we use for thinking about policies to intervene now in um, addressing climate change um, ought to use a very low rate of uh, a social discount rate and a zero time preference rate. This is an ethical point. This is a point that future generations have the same moral claim on the resources of the planet that we do, and we should not literally discount their utility. 
And then uh, the point, the other point in the column was about uh, abandoning this idea that we can target, um, uh, we can aim for one target with one instrument. And so for climate change, one instrument, say it's a carbon tax would be enough. That when you're talking about big system changes and dynamic nonlinear systems, you can't compartmentalize the instruments. And um, so this is uh, fantastic. Um, but I would also point you to this other recent paper by Nick Stern, really accusing the economics profession as a whole of not having taken climate change seriously enough, arguing that economics itself needs to change. And I think one of the evidence points there is that the top five journals, which as I'm sure many of you know, shape appointments and promotions in economics departments, really have not paid very much attention to climate change economics. There is a lot of climate change economics done, it's excellent, but it's done outside that core sense of what the discipline should be doing and with different sets of tools and methodologies than are um, considered appropriate in, in the top journals. And I do commend uh, Nick Stern's paper to you, it's really very powerful. Um, so I want to get on to um, the implications of this for economics and, and loop back to the diversity point I started with. Um, this is a Phillips machine. There's one in the LSE library, I believe still. This is the one that's in the Department of Economics here in Cambridge. And this is the concept that I think has now um, really uh, gone from economics that um, there's a mechanistic world and we are the cogs in this machine and you can represent the economy in this very mechanistic way. So this has gone from mainstream economics, but I think some of the flaws still remain. The insistence on method methodological individualism, um, the benchmark that we have, that you've got a, an individual maximizing utility or a firm maximizing profit, and that you have the fundamental theorems of economics that tell you, take you to the starting point that markets are the best way, the most efficient way of organizing production and consumption. And that this is a, a positive and not a normative, not a, a value laden kind of assessment. So we started this journey to move away from the Phillips machine. But one of the reasons I'm concerned about the approach is that it's being adopted in um, machine learning. This is one of those lovely, uh, frightening Boston Dynamics robots. And I'm sure many of you have seen the videos. They, they are absolutely terrifying. And what's happening in machine learning is that the economic model of utility maximization with a defined reward function or a defined target, you know, the equivalent of utility or, or profit, is being um, amped up, it's being put on steroids. And so a lot of the problems that are emerging, the problem of uh, data bias, the problem of um, uh, delivering to a target that is actually too narrow a representation of the objective that you really want to achieve just as target setting in public services led to hitting the targets, but not delivering on the fundamental aims of the service. Um, that's all being um, adopted um, machine, in machine learning, which is being adopted in public policy decision-making. And in some areas that's fine because our interests are aligned. We want our banks to be able to use these clever systems to identify fraud, but it's being adopted in public policy areas like criminal justice, uh, policing, uh, decisions on welfare benefits, where it will have a very profound impact on people's lives. And so the analogy is that in AI, there is a real ethics moment. And the researchers in that domain have completely understood that they can't go down this path of utility maximization subject to constraints and with narrowly defined targets, because it's not going to serve society. And that's the analogy that I want to draw, that in economics, we need an ethics moment. We need to rethink welfare economics, which has been under-researched and under-taught, I think, since the 1970s or early 80s, and um, embrace that normative, that ethical dimension of economics, rather than simply claiming that all we're doing is the plumbing. Um, and so this just makes that point uh, about the parallels between economics and, and AI, the alignment problem is the narrowly defined targets, data bias problems. As economists, we're much too prone to download data sets without thinking enough as a sociologist would about how that data was constructed and what it means, 
who reported the data? What are the relationships within the family that determine who says what in, in the panel surveys and so on? And um, the, the fundamental problem that we're all grappling with, giving policy advice, is that we're in a multidimensional world. It's very complicated, it's moving quickly, there's a lot changing, and people care about more than one dimension of things. But when you're a policymaker, you have to make a single decision. And that's a really um, difficult ethical question that a lot of philosophers have been grappling with, and we should start to grapple with more and have our own ethics moment. Computer science also has a diversity problem, um, very similar to economics. So here's the, this is a, a reference to the title of the book. Um, the cogs are the way that economists think about, um, uh, or at least used to think about individual maximizers, methodological individualism. We're not mechanistic, but we are those cogs. Uh, and yet we have this whole territory of change in the economy uh, which encompasses climate change, encompasses instability in financial systems, a complex, uh, non-linear, dynamic world, and a vast unexplored territory. So the argument I want to make is that economics needs a different starting point, and um, it needs to be uh, a starting point that is not linear, static, constant returns, and we add to that the complexities. So we start with something simple, and we add externalities or we add heterogeneities uh, and, um, and uh, we, we start with a bias towards the market. We can identify a market failure. And as a policy analyst, if you identify that market failure, you can think up an intervention that might fix that, having in the back of your mind that governments fail as well. I think we need to completely flip the starting point. The economy is non-linear, it's dynamic. Increasing returns are everywhere externalities are pervasive. And yet we don't have even very good methods for thinking about how to quantify these. I'm doing work at the moment trying to think about how do you value a data set? How do you value free digital goods? And we don't have good methodologies for doing this. And whenever I present this work to economists, they say, well, the methodology is a bit flaky, to which the answer is, come up with better methodologies if you should be thinking about these questions, because this is what our economy is like now. Uh, we can't assume fixed preferences. Madison Avenue has known that since the 1950s. We still assume fixed preferences in economics. We need to work much more with sociologists and psychologists to understand how preferences get shaped. And that goes beyond the very rich agenda of behavioral economics to thinking about um, uh, theories of uh, psychological change and what it is that forms preferences in the first place. So it's not that there are fixed preferences, they're just different. And as the analyst, we have a better sense of what they are. Um, it's thinking about how they get formed in the first place. Starting from the social and not the individual, the influences that we have on each other, the problems of coordination in this complex, non-linear dynamic economy, and the bias towards institutions. And um, the response I would often get from economists when I talk about this is, well, we do this, and you can see there are some great papers in Econometrica or um, the QJE that talk about these things, and that's absolutely true. And so back to my starting point, there are great things going on in economics, and I'm trying to push in the direction that we do even more great things, but particularly that we flip the benchmark that we start from in our teaching, in the courses that we teach, and in the way that policy analysis is done, because people who are in government, e e the government economic service were in our courses a little while ago, um, to, to reflect this, this um, instinct, where, where do our instincts go as economists, and what do we think is the first thing to think about. And then just to loop back finally to um, the diversity point, the point I really want to get across is that many, many people in economics now understand that the lack of diversity is a problem, but perhaps not why it's a problem. And it isn't just about the A-level curriculum and what, get, what gets taught in schools. And it's not just about who appears as an economist on the TV and who are role models. It's about the content of economics and the range of methodologies. It's about the questions that are being asked and the ways that it's considered permissible to answer those questions and what that means for the culture of economics. And until we can fix those 
uh, ways we think and ways we operate as economists, we're not going to fix the diversity problem. It's a much deeper problem than that. So half the people decide that they don't want to do economics, and that's not to do with the people, it's to do with, it's to do with the economics. So here's my shopping list. Think about big problems, think about climate change, think about financial stability. We should be addressing these or we're not serving our civic duties. Uh, it's not enough to think about small, well-defined problems with the very clever techniques that we have. I would really like people to think harder about data, something I've been working on for many years. There's a politics of data, there's a sociology of data, all data is biased. It's the only lens we have to think well about the world but we need to understand its limitations and also accept that there's a much, much wider range of things that count as data. Words are data and images are data as well. So there's a much richer world of data out there and numbers of economic um, variables. We need to think about political economy again. And it's not enough as a policy economist to say, this is the right thing to do, this is the efficient solution, but the politicians will never implement that. If you haven't thought about the political feasibility, you haven't actually done the right analysis. That's part of what you should be analyzing. We need to, of course, try to be objective and impartial and evidence-based, but abandon that separation between the positive and the normative, or at least recognize that what we say is bound to have uh, value-laden aspects to it and think about the ethics of economics in the way that AI is thinking about the ethics of AI. And finally, work with a much broader range of disciplines. I do think this is something that applies to all university departments, not just economics. As civic institutions, we're only going to address these really big problems if we work together as engineers, computer scientists, sociologists, historians, all of them together. Um, but economics is more inward looking than other disciplines, cites less, uh, co-authors less with other disciplines. And we need to get away from this um, similarity we have with uh, the Silicon Valley tech grows and, and diversify economics. So that's me having looped back and that's um, the slide. So I will stop sharing now and um, be very happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Diane, for your presentation. We will now open the floor to questions from the audience. Please type short questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer as many as we can. And if possible, please add your name and affiliation. So we have a few questions already and uh, I will take two of them together from Tarima, Tarim Fatima and David Thaw. And they're both about the you know, under representation of many groups in society in, in economics. Um, Tareem says increasing representation of underrepresented community comes with a host of problems. My concern is that underrepresented communities have certain intellectual or background disadvantages, for example, access to quality education because of financial constraints or overall quality of education in their community. Given these disadvantages, what steps can be taken to increase participation? And David is an economics teacher at Bromley High School, and he agrees that economics would be improved if economists were more representative of society. How would you recommend I encourage girls to study economics here at Bromley High School and to continue their study of the subject? Um, no, they're, they're both great questions. Thank you, um, Tareem and David. Um, so everybody has um, experience of life. And although it's clearly the case that people who go to some schools have a more disadvantaged start than other people, they also have different kinds of experiences. And so I think I've got a two part answer to that question. One is that there are things that can be done and are being done to overcome disadvantages. And um, I think the Royal Economic Society, the Society of Professional Economists, um, the Government Economic Service have all been trying very hard by going into schools to talk to people um, and other initiatives at the apprenticeship scheme of the GES to help overcome some of those educational disadvantages or, or, or um, 
you know, um, financial disadvantages that people have had. I've been one of the many authors contributing to the core economy textbook, which is a book that you can buy, but it's much cheaper than other textbooks and it's also free online with lots of fantastic resources. So those are important, but I wouldn't undervalue the importance for economics of people coming from different kinds of backgrounds and bringing different kinds of experience to bear. Because as I was trying to explain, I think that just makes you think of different kinds of research questions or frame them in different ways or understand some of the messages that you would get from data. And that's an advantage actually compared to the traditional over-represented groups. That, that kind of diversity of perspective is a real advantage. And so that's the two parts to that, that, that um, question. It is a, an uphill struggle um, getting people who don't think economics is, is for them to change their minds about it because we're starting from where we are. And it's like the old joke, if you want to get to somewhere else, you'd start from some, somewhere different. Um, and I'm not sure I've got a good answer apart from the long haul of taking parts in lots of events. Um, I, I talk to schools um, quite a lot less in the pandemic, but as, as much as possible um, to encourage, you know, just to be, a, be there as a role model who is a female economist and um, lots of other people do the same. Again, lots of initiatives to do so. And um, this communication point, I think, is really important for many reasons. It's both to showcase that there are different kinds of economists already, um, but it's also to demystify the language and to try to explain to people that we care about a lot of the subjects that actually young people in schools care about as well. And in a sense, people like the geographers have staked their claim to that territory or people doing business studies because if you look at their websites, they're full of questions about inequality and climate and um, fairness and justice and all of the things that young people care about. And that's not always, in, it's not always obvious from what economists put out in public that we care about the same things. And we think we've got great tools for answering those kinds of questions. So I, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not marketing, it's just actually explaining that economics is not all about making lots, lots of money in the city which is a perception that a lot of people have. But I don't have a quick fix for it. And if I did, um, I hope we wouldn't be in the situation we are. So I can't um, give you much more en encouragement than that. Um, thanks, Diane. So we have a lot of uh, questions coming in. Um, one, one of the the aspects related to diversity, you know, you touched on the working with other disciplines and we have some questions around that. How do you envis envisage um, economists working with the more qualitative sciences where there's a very different mindset? Um, maybe you have some thoughts on that. I, I do. I've been, um, our institute here, the Bennett Institute, is interdisciplinary. So I have been working with engineers and computer scientists and with um, legal scholars, but, but also with people in sociology and political science who've used qualitative methods. And I've learned an incredible amount out of it. And one of the um, things that seems very important to me is that you get a, a granularity of information from qualitative methods that you don't from our traditional econometric methods. And Although the, the, you know, the causal revolution, if you like, has me means that we could do causal inference much better, there are still going to be limits to that, given particularly macro, you've got a, a limited amount of data, um, highly correlated variables. Can you really um, confidently identify causal relationships there? Well, you can increase your confidence by thinking about qualitative approaches. In macroeconomics, it might be thinking about history, we, we um, actually can learn a lot from looking at different historical episodes in the way that historians look at them as well as the way that economists look at them. And um, you know, similarly, qualitative methods just give you insights that you don't get from uh, any kind of data set. And actually there's a lot of data involved, which is one of the points I, I tried to make, Mega, megabytes of data from transcripts and very rigorous techniques for doing surveys, doing interviews, analyzing the data. 
So there's this sense in economics that qualitative work is a bit woolly. And my great discovery in the past, I don't know, half decade or so has been that that's actually not the case. Some of it is, but then there's some not very good econometrics out there as well. And actually it's a really powerful tool. And by putting them together, you can get much more insight into the world. The difficulty in interdisciplinary work is that we speak different languages. And so it's, it's time consuming. You've got to have a lot of conversations to understand what the other person is talking about and have that patience and understand that the same word can have different meanings and different concepts. And um, it's really interesting and really enjoyable, but really, really hard work. But I do think universities have to do much more of that to be able to deliver for the taxpayers and supporters and the students um, and, and address these really big challenges that we're facing. Okay, um, so maybe we'll move on a little bit. Here is a, a question from Stephanie Cooperstein. Um, politicians' outlooks are more short-term than ever. How can economists induce more long-term views in this environment? Mm. Seems like a really important one. It is a really important one. And I'm not sure I've got an answer to that really. Um, with one of my colleagues here, we just looked at the history of industrial policy in the UK and it changes so frequently and every change of policy leaves a sort of um, flotsam of different kinds of institutions and schemes. So you've got an incredibly complicated landscape. And I think one of the um, issues about low productivity in this country is exactly that we've got very short termist policies. Businesses get really annoyed when you talk about them being short termist because of shareholder pressures, because they are making investments with 10 or 50 year time horizons in some cases, whereas politicians increasingly seem to be thinking about the next tweet. The next tweet. And there's um, also a really nice quote from Keynes, which I won't remember exactly, but it's something like evidence being the last thing any politician wants if it's going to challenge their deeply cherished and long held beliefs. So I think this interaction between economic analysis and political decision making in the context of politics now is one that we need to understand better. What is it that has made politics so, so short term? And it isn't just the electoral system being first past the post because actually in the UK, we've got more short termist policies than the United States, which is also first past the post. Um, it maybe it's about social media or the media more generally. Um, maybe it plays into these dynamics about populism in different countries, which is a long way of saying I, I don't know how to change that. But I think we really have to understand it because any advice we try to land as, econ as policy analysts um, just isn't, isn't going to work unless you can get the, tra the political traction that's necessary for it. And I, I do think we've got a particular problem in the UK with uh, a very centralized state, as well as one that's got the first past the post um, dynamics of polarization. Um, so it's a, a very big challenge. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to go back to talking about political economy and not just economics divorced from the politics. Okay, here's a question from Avram Liebenau. He's an MSc political science and political economy student, and he wants to know a little bit more about the reboot of welfare economics. Why do you see this as being especially important? And is it intended to be a reaction to, for example, the financialization of economics departments? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And um, I'm old enough that I was taught some welfare economics as an undergraduate and the 1970s uh, saw the publication of a number of absolutely classic texts on welfare economics. And it's something that seems to have faded from the curriculum then, which I think is linked as the question, uh, as Avram hinted in the question, to um, a political philosophy that took hold, first of all, in the US and the UK, and then more broadly, in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And it was this um, presumption that you start with the idea that the markets are going to give you the best solution. Um, it was the deregulatory Thatcherite and Hayekian uh, turn in, in our public philosophy. And um, 
I think that means that many people thought we could stop thinking about welfare economics. But actually, there are some really, really big issues to resolve. I would put at the top this question about do we want to stick with the utilitarian or consequentialist framework? The way we think about it in economics is seen as naive by philosophers. And we've never really addressed the challenge from the capabilities approach of Marci Sen and Martin, Martin Usbam, um, and this issue about can we take account of the many dimensions along which people's lives can change if you're thinking about well-being versus utility. Um, we need to think about aggregation and distribution. And this is, as I was trying to argue, something that we've put to one side. As economists, you know, at least until um, Piketty's book in 2014, we didn't really comment very much in public about what was happening in terms of distribution. Is that something we, we can afford not to put at the center of, of policy analysis? Even something that seems really technical like cost benefit analysis has very strong distributional implications. And um, you know, the very deep questions about, about aggregation, about the relationship between um, economic aims and, and well-being and behavioral economics, so I think there's a whole absolutely wonderful, rich research agenda in welfare economics. And I, I don't see very much work going on there at the moment. Uh, it doesn't seem to be fashionable among graduate students, seems to have dropped out of the curriculum. And so um, with Tim Besley of the LSE and um, colleagues from Oxford, Eric Beinhoff and Margaret Stevens, we're planning a workshop to try to do some thinking about this next year. But it's an area where I would love it if um, other students got interested. Hmm. We maybe abuse the chair's position and, and get a sort of aspect of my own. And I have a little bit the impression what we do in economics is that uh, we solve the questions where we have the tools for. So, you know, the tension between efficiency where we have a, a measure that can be operationalized easily versus inequality. There are, of course, many inequality measures too, but the problem is there are many of them and then we're in this game of having to make decisions. So we stick to the, the easy tools and solve those questions. Or, you know, I feel this in, in statistical work, um, we quantify uncertainty of what we learn by standard errors, but that's really only one aspect of how right we've gotten things. And we don't think of any other aspects because we don't have tools that work and people don't, don't work on these. Yes. Is, is, is that what you feel is missing? How do we get economists to work on things that they're not used to? Well, I do agree with you. And I think a lot of this, the teaching, at least at graduate level is very tool focused. Mm. And actually certain tools become fashionable um, because they're very technical and you feel like you're at the forefront of something difficult and exciting. And I completely understand the impulse. Uh, and, and so being more question focused and thinking about ways to address big questions would be uh, one way to take it. I mean, just to give a small intervention that might be a good thing to reintroduce, well, when I was a graduate student, which was the early 1980s, um, we still had a requirement to do economic history courses. And they do take you to big questions. You start to ask things like, what caused the Great Depression? Um, or uh, what were the drivers of the Industrial Revolution? And what about all the misery that, that created in cities? And how do we think about that? So um, that's one way of just trying to reintroduce a, a, a mixture of thinking about big problems and, and thinking about the techniques that we have to address them. Okay, there's a whole other set of questions, comments on sort of approaches to economics and I'll take um, three together. There's one from M. Johnson asking about whether you agree with Jennifer Longfell, the measure of economic wealth should be health and not price. Uh, one from Ian Bright, um, who wants to know about the network approach to economics that Paul Omerod has written about and Enrique Gose, a student um, at the, in the LSE MSc Development Management, 
um, wants to know about donut economics from Kate Raworth. Um, don't know whether you're familiar with these and are able to comment. Um, I'll try. I didn't quite catch the first one, but I'll come back to you on that. Uh, I've, I like Paul Ulmer's uh, books. He's published some really interesting books over the years, thinking about um, networks and evolutionary economics. And um, of course, there are some fantastic economists, including some of my colleagues here, who work on, on um, network models and uh, actual empirical evidence on how networks operate. And um, it's obviously in incredibly interesting, rich work. Um, so I've thought about it in the context of digital markets, where the, um, the network effects are the um, externalities, if you like, if you want to frame it that way, whereby the more people join um, a social media platform or any other kind of digital platform, the better it is for everybody else who's already on the platform. And so they embed um, interactions between individuals and you can't really think about um, the individual choices without taking account of, uh, of the whole of the network. So it's a, um, a, just a different lens for thinking about the dynamics of the market and the market structures and the form that competition takes. Um, so that's um, you know, an, another way in which one can think about networks and economics. So it, it, either in that, at that scale, at the market scale, it takes you to a different set of dynamics and thinking about important areas of economic policy, or you can think about it at a more, at a more micro scale and, for example, think about um, how, uh, how well off um, people in communities become of, because of the networks that operate in their communities. Um, so the sociologist concept of, of weak links uh, relates to network structures and you can look at whether people in a de depressed seaside town uh, are, are um, trapped there because of the kind of social structures ha they have in the networks in which they operate and think about interventions, what are now called social infrastructure, to um, provide uh, places for those weak ties to form and give them more opportunities. So it's um, just a, a, a different lens from the one that is normally taught and used by mainstream economists, lots of good economists doing this kind of work and um, a really interesting and valuable kind of approach. So that's that one. On donut economics, um, this is an incredibly powerful metaphor, if you like, and a lot of cities around the world are finding it incredibly attractive. And the basic point is that the economy operates inside nature. It's the point that Parth Dasgupta just made in his um, report on biodiversity. And uh, nature is in the economy and the economy is in nature. You can't analyze them separately. And so uh, a lot of, um, at local level, a lot of uh, city authorities are starting to try to use the donut model to implement their, the policies over which they have some, some control. Um, I think it doesn't speak to a lot of economists because it's just a different kind of language. It doesn't map very easily onto the concepts that we use in economic models. And um, the other thing that I found about it in discussions with um, colleagues in um, lower income countries is that they're a little bit wary of whether this is something that you can only afford when you um, get to be a rich economy. So there's some wariness about it. But it's obviously in, in terms of embedding the idea of the importance of nature to the economy being incredibly influential and is actually being acted on. So, um, you know, very high impact approach to thinking about the environment and the economy together. I didn't catch the first question, Steve, if you could repeat that one. Um, so it, it was about Jennifer Longfell's measure that uh, economic wealth should be measured as health and not price. I don't know her work, but um, I would refer to the World Bank's Comprehensive Wealth Framework, which we use here to think about, if you like, a balance sheet for the economy, which does include human capital and therefore does include health and includes the interactions between different kinds of capital. So social, human, um, uh, intangible, natural capital. To give a simple example, the quality of the air that we breathe has had an impact on people's health outcomes during the pandemic and therefore on human capital. 
And so you need to think about these assets as part, of, as part of the economy. So if that's the philosophy behind the work that's being referred to, then I would agree with that, but I, I don't know that particular work. We have a few questions relating to market structure and competition policy that you've talked about. Here's one from Christina. In relation to the role of competition authorities in the contribution to energy and green transition, do you see that a shift in focus from static price effects and efficiencies to dynamic effects would be enough to overcome the challenges that the traditional economic efficiencies framework presents? So that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that struck me in the petrol shortage was that there was a need for um, a release from competition rules for petrol station chains to be allowed to share information with each other about who had some available and where the deliveries were going and so on. And um, in some work I've been doing thinking about the sharing of data and the way that could increase productivity in supply chains, you come to the same kind of issue that we've got a competition framework that for good understandable reasons says that it's a bad thing for companies to share information with each other. And so the conclusion I've drawn from that is that we actually need to think about different kinds of information in different ways. And there will be a level of cooperation that's necessary for productivity gains in the supply chain, and then a level of competition, and you don't share information about what prices you're going to charge, for example. And I think there's something similar that's needed in green transition or in digital markets where um, interoperability and data portability are going to be important parts of making competition effective. And I think the requirement will be to have um, some analysis and a uh, legislation about or, or competition rulings about what's the what are the technical standards in terms of information or, or literal technical standards um, that set the basis for the market that will enable the market to grow to scale and that will align expectations about which direction investment and innovation should be going and that's going to be important for enabling green transition. So it would be things, for example, like um, the standards for the voltage and um, uh, the plugs for uh, chargers, or um, if you're thinking about autonomous vehicles, um, the data sharing that that enables and the, and the data standards. Uh, so it's just what, at what level of the technology stack, if you like, are we going to say, this is common information, it's gotta be shared, and it's the role of the regulator to enable the growth of the market by, by setting those standards. So I think that will need to be done for green transition to happen in the way that we need it to. Um, there's a question from Andrew Purvis, a PhD student at UCL. And uh, he says, you implied that economics must change to take account of new technologies and so forth, which offer greater opportunity to monopoly power. To what extent is this the case? Surely it has ever been thus. For example, car manufacturing post-war consolidated rapidly and came to be dominated by a handful of global companies. Yeah. Um, let me also point out various of the questioners are um, really applauding you for your lecture and are very inspired by what you've said, and I've not always read that out, but uh, I do want to not forget mentioning it. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, Andrew is absolutely right. It's long been an increasing returns to scale economy. And I suppose um, I think the point about digital is not that it's different. It's just that it's more, uh, the scale is bigger because the structure of the fixed cost to marginal costs is more pronounced. And um, it's, it's, if you like, the final straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, Will Baumol, his PhD thesis, I think it was an LSE PhD actually, um, published as a book in 1956 or 57, made exactly this point. He said, um, the, the idea that we can pretend it's a constant returns to scale economy and that uh, people are not influencing each other through scale effects is for the birds. And he was right, it was, true in, it was true enough in 1956. 
but actually it hasn't been at the core of how we think about the economy. Any production decision in almost any market you could think about, unless it's maybe a local cafe, is going to have some kind of scale effects and these are really important. And the, but, but the only difference is that the scale now for a company like, um, uh, you know, um, the big Chinese and American tech giants, the scale is, is just so much bigger than almost all of the material economy markets that we're used to. So Nico McDonald from London South Bank University and the University of Arts London asks, how should economists approach the issue of cost benefit analysis of government responses to the COVID pandemic? especially around lockdown, who responded well, but wasn't paid sufficient attention? Um, it's a great question. I mean, the pandemic really highlighted, didn't it? Um, the injustice of the low pay and poor work conditions that so many key workers experience. And I personally would hope that one of the outcomes is that it, it leads to some rethinking about value in society in that fundamental ethical sense. I don't think you can do a cost benefit analysis though of the pandemic. And um, the reason is that it's actually just going to be a long time before we know, um, is it over? Um, what are the long-term effects on people's health? And um, evaluating those impacts across countries when the structure of the data that's provided is so different is quite a complex task. So I'm not going to rush to say one country did it better than another. Um, I think it's much too soon to do that. Uh, though I, I will say that I don't think there was a trade-off. The, the, the idea that it was a simple trade-off between the economy and, and the epidemic is just not true in the data. But you have to interpret the data with care. We do a lot of testing in the UK. So our case positivity rate doesn't look as bad compared to other countries as our absolute case numbers would suggest. And so um, there's a lot of kind of over-interpretation of, of data without thinking really carefully about how it's reported and how it's structured. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's the case that the, any inquiry we have will be very politicized, um, but these are quite deep questions. And I hope there's a lot of thoughtful academic reflection about the experience and the lessons we can take from it as well. And one of the key lessons I take is, is about the importance of, of um, social infrastructure, including the health service as social infrastructure. So here's a question I think that often comes up in discussions about economic methodology from Mark Falcon, a competition economist. Economists and scientists generally suffer from misunderstanding of what models are for, that is hypothesis inferences to best um, to best explain things, not truth claims. This leaves economics open to easy attack for unrealistic assumptions, false dichotomies between economics and physics and so on that economists struggle to elucidate. So it's a point people quite often make that economists rely too much on simplistic models. And I have mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, the world is messy and complicated and you've got to have a model. And even historians have models. They have models about the causes of the Second World War or the Great Depression. And reducing the dimensionality of the questions that we're trying to, trying to formulate and understand is inherent in not only doing research, but being human, I think, um, even at the level of creating narratives that we, we tell ourselves. So I think that's universal. Having said that, I do have some sympathy with the idea that economists then put too, weight on, too much weight on their models. Seems to me that there's quite a lot of circular thinking about it. You make some assumptions, you forget you've made the assumptions and you draw the conclusion that actually comes from the assumptions or, um, or just an over-reliance over on them. It isn't just economists. I mean, I think other professions and, and the financial institutions over-rely on models as well. And so one of the points in um, John K. Mervyn King's book that I would agree with is that in finance too, there was just too much um, 
belief that what the model said was was the answer and that the model was given too much weight. Another question from Yusuke Takeda. Um, he says he's a macroeconomist in Japan and uh, read your book on GDP. Macroeconomics should change both theory and measurement simultaneously, especially when GDP statistics contain many problems associated with the current digital economy. Let me hear your opinion on that point. I'm uh, very preoccupied with how you measure the economy and particularly the digital economy. And um, it's a bit weird when you think about it that we, since 2007, we've all had smartphones. We've been on um, Wi-Fi or 3G pretty constantly. This has transformed the way we lead our daily lives, the way that business models operate and what businesses do, and even the range of services that, uh, that are available to you. And this is um, almost invisible in statistics. We don't really have a good handle on how much a company is using uh, cloud computing and data centers, or um, how do we think about um, what it is that uh, consumers are buying and should go into a price index when a lot of things that we use to buy separate products are now free apps on the smartphone. And so my sense of it is that the gap between GDP is a good enough indicator of economic welfare and actual economic welfare is getting wider. And um, that's why I've been interested in thinking about um, uh, different approaches to understanding the value pe people place on free digital goods, uh, using state of preference methods to, to um, get, get some numbers, to put some numbers on that. And I've done a piece of work with David Nian looking at that compared to some free non-digital goods like public parks and some paid for goods that are substitutes for digital goods. And um, economists don't like it. They find this a sort of woolly kind of method and that you can't really understand what the numbers mean. And they, they smell bad because they're big. If you do this kind of method, you always get very large uh, stated uh, numbers that people say they would need to give up Facebook or to give up TikTok. And um, I think this misses the point that because they're free, the number that people give you um, needs to be considered against a time budget constraint because we've got 24 hours a day it's an absolute identity. We've got to spend those 24 hours a day. We're spending a day a week online. And so what I'm thinking about now is thinking about how we spend our time as a lens on productivity and consumer welfare. So how happy, if you like, does it make us to spend our time looking at Twitter or unhappy as the case may be? But similarly, if you start asking that question, you have to ask, um, does being at, in a paid job make people increase their well-being or not? How much well-being do people get from household production? And by the way, they're substituting household production for some things that were in the market because of these digital transformations. And so um, it's pretty complicated and it doesn't map well onto the system of national accounts for collecting macroeconomic statistics. And it's another area of um, you know, really live and interesting research agenda that I hope lots of people are going to get into. It's very fascinating listening to you, Diane, and we have a number more questions and could probably go on all evening, but I think we're slowly coming to a close. So I want you to close with answers to two questions. One is from Malak Shaban, an A-level student in London, and he would like to know what is the best way to start challenging the economics I'm taught in the classroom? And then I add a um, question from John Staples, who would like to know, how would you rename the LSE to reflect the changes you wish to see in the way economics is taught and used? Gosh, um, so in terms of challenging what you're taught, um, uh, even asking that question shows uh, somebody who's going to do a lot of challenging in their career, which is fantastic. And um, I think it's always, how does what you're teaching me help address the things that really matter? Um, and it's, so it's the big questions. How does, how does whatever I'm being taught now help me, help us collectively 
address these really big things that we're nowhere facing, um, climate, biodiversity, aging populations, digital transformation, technological transformation, personalized medicines. What are the economic tools that I, as a future economist, will be able to bring to bear to do my bit in helping make society better? So I think it's, it's that kind of question. I don't think you can name the LS, rename the LSE because it's so such a um, has such a strong reputation globally. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, rise to that challenge, I'm afraid. And obviously, the LSE does much more than economics anyway. And I'm sure there are lots of fantastic people at least integrating work across the social sciences. So I will um, I will decline to answer John's question, but thank you anyway. Thank you, Diane. And sorry again to everybody else whose question we haven't gotten to, but um, it's been great to hear Diane talk to us about such a variety of issues connected um, to her book and talk. Um, it's been a great opportunity, and I think all of you like listening to Diane. Um, thank you to all of you in the audience who've joined us today. Um, thank you, Diane, for taking part and making time for this. Diane was talking about her new book, Cox and Monsters, details of which can be found on the event listing. Thank you again, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alessi, and thank you, everybody. <laughs>